The disaster work is becoming more and more dangerous, and it's also becoming more and more emotionally challenging. Uh, the disaster relief uh, workers have been injured, they have been killed in fatal and non-fatal attacks on humanitarian and disaster relief workers uh, is steadily increasing. Yet the demand for people who are willing to risk their lives and leave the comfort of their own homes uh, to help others uh, is also on the rise because of the geopolitical conflicts and climate changes uh, that lead to more frequent um, armed conflicts like what we have right now in Ukraine or natural disasters like the recent uh, earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Those events create a setting for a frequently long-lasting uh, emotional trauma that can affect the psychosocial functioning, not only the victims of the war, but also people who call to help them. The Helping Healers Heal program is uh, currently working in Ukraine, supporting Ukrainian psychotherapists in their effort uh, to recover and restore the mental health of Ukrainian people traumatized by the ongoing war. As a clinical director of Helping Healers Heal program, I do hope that we will be able to provide the same high level of support uh, to healthcare and mental health clinicians who are currently working in disaster area in Turkey, trying to save, help, and assist as many people as they possibly can. And yet, along the way, those mental health clinicians and healthcare workers also working in traumatic events. They're also working in traumatic settings. They're witnessing and experiencing the trauma of loss and destruction. But what is trauma? Trauma usually refers to an intense and overwhelming experience that involves serious loss, threat, or harm to a person's physical or, and frequently it goes together, emotional well-being. Uh, those experiences may occur at any time in a person's life. Uh, they may involve a single traumatic event, or they uh, can be repeated over many years. Uh, there also can be a prolonged single traumatic event. Uh, there are different types of trauma. There is a direct trauma that involves the threat um, of um, to, to, to the physical or and emotional well-being of, of a victim. But there is also a secondary trauma, it could be called vicarious trauma, it could be called a trauma of a witness that results from witnessing a traumatic event or being in a traumatic event or being close to a traumatic event. And of course, there are different examples of trauma. It could be mass casualties, uh, witnessing violence, uh, catastrophic loss, displacement, food insufficiency, uh, um, lack of our uh, loss of basic um, basic needs and ability access to basic needs, uh, homelessness. Uh, trauma is not only an emotional experience. And I think that what is very important to remember that it is not just a feeling of being threatened. Uh, it also a neurophysiological uh, experience because it sort of creates a chaos in our brain. And exposure to a traumatic event um, activates the psychological response that alter the neurological functioning of an individual. A traumatic experience triggers a state of arousal in, and in the body in sort of this heightened state of alertness and fearfulness uh, for one's safety. While those adaptations may be necessary for survival in hostile world, um, traumatic experiences can become a way of life uh, that is difficult to change even if the environment changes or the threat is no longer there. And trauma itself significantly increases the risk of neurological biological, physiological, and other uh, deficiencies over the lifespan. However, what I think is very important to also remember is that not all trauma created equal. 
acute stress disorder, um, which is uh, sort of a, a short-lived response to the traumatic um, environment, traumatic setting, or trauma. Uh, the the um, acute stress disorder usually lasts uh, for one month. It appears relatively quickly, and it um, after a specific exposure to a stressor, and includes a spectrum of emotional uh, reactions. It's it's also includes a cognitive changes, like for example, confusion, uh, also some symptoms of mental and physical hyperactivity. However, PTSD, which is the worrisome uh, disorder because the PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder, the symptoms appear between one and three months. And if left untreated or not addressed, this condition can become a lifelong and can become chronic and debilitating. Every disaster relief work uh, or humanitarian work, of course, also involves um, physical stress, lack of sleep, emotional stress, hypervigilance. It also in involves witnessing the traumatic events. And the very context of uh, humanitarian disasters often characterized by acute time pressures a lack of resources and unfamiliar circumstances, all of which is very stressful for medical professionals, for mental health professionals, for uh, the um, rescue workers. But disaster contexts are complicated. Um, and often people do have difficulties to make decisions that can stay with them for a, a very long time, even though if they believe that those decisions were the right ones. And that may result in the feeling of regret and guilt and powerlessness, can result in, in a sort of feeling frustrated, uh, it could, could result in uh, physical symptoms like uh, some kind of unclear pains and aches and illness. So in times of disaster relief, uh, the decisions need to be made very quickly. And sometimes the ethical professional principles and practice might not be aligned with the decisions and might not be helpful. And that kind of that's that moral discontent, that that moral um, distress can result in burnout. And burnout itself also has very um clear sort of symptoms to it. There are physical side to burnout when we have uh, healthcare professionals, mental health professionals, first responders to feel fatigued and emotional and kind of with that emotional physical exhaustion, have difficulty sleeping, they have gastrointestinal uh, problems. There is also emotional side uh, to burnout, which is irritability and anxiety, depression sense of guilt. Um, there, are, there are symptoms that related to, to work performance. Uh, there are symptoms that sort of affect an interpersonal side of life, like a withdrawal, poor communication, uh, distancing themselves from the situation. So for any healthcare provider, mental health clinician, and first responders, the rescue workers, is essential to recognize and understand and to address the symptoms that lead to PTSD and burnout. And what can we do about that? And I think that's where sort of the programs like Helping Healers Heal do come um, to play their important role. Um, first and foremost, of course, on the personal level, uh, we need to recognize and understand and appreciate what we, and by we, I mean healthcare professionals, mental health clinicians, the disaster uh, relief workers, what we are going through when we are placed in this very traumatic, high, highly charged emotional state and accept that this is what is happening to us also. It's not that we're just helping, this trauma is happening to us also, maybe not directly, 
We're not threatened for our lives, but it's still making its imprint on us. So the development of this flexibility, the maturity of accepting that there are certain limitations to what we can handle, um, sustainability, adaptability, and ability to work in teams is very important. The knowledge that stress can be cumulative, especially in the setting of scarcity of relief workers uh, and in the, um, in the face of significant need is the utmost important because then people can trace their symptoms. Those who know will see it. Those who know what to look for will understand what they're going through and will seek help as soon as they will start feeling this way, of course, provided that they have time and opportunity to do so without really compounding the effect. Um, of course, regular debriefings, um, and they can be of different sorts. Uh, they, they could be peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, they could be a, a sort of a group support. They could be a direct a mental health uh, support body system, any sort of setting where the people who are helping others are able to really speak to their own experience, to their own feelings. It doesn't have to be going into every details, but just have that opportunity to be able to speak is very important and necessary in, uh, in um, work in uh, highly affected zones, be it again, war zone or the, um, the zone of natural disaster. Um, of course, ideally it would be great to have a, a mental health clinician. This is what, again, the, the, the helping healers heal is offering, is to have that ability and opportunity to speak to a mental health clinician and to maybe explore some strategies and skills and techniques on stress management and maybe really have a little bit of a check in with yourself of where I am, what is happening to me, because that will allow for sustainability, that will allow to replenish resources, that will allow to start processing the traumatic experiences before the compounded effect sets in. I think what is also important that there is there must be a recognition of the effects of traumatic um, events on those who are helping others, um, including the fact that there is not just a primary traumatization, but also a secondary traumatization of healthcare and mental health providers who are treating civilians. Those who work in a disaster relief uh, should be able to recognize the symptoms of acute stress disorder and recognize the symptoms of acute stress and burnout before it becomes a disorder, before it leads to more serious psychosocial deficiencies um, and get appropriate support uh, from the group like Helping Healers Heal, which of course centered around that peer-to-peer -peer support and this way, I think the disaster relief workers will build that necessary and so much needed resilience and sustainability and will replenish their resources in a challenging but uh, very much needed line of work of humanitarian relief efforts. Thank you.